15 minute or less lecture series anatomy and physiology chapter 4 cellular metabolism metabolism is all the chemical reactions that occur in a human being or anything really that produces or uses energy so when we break things down digestion that's metabolism when we take these small components and build them back up to form the various structures inside our body that is metabolism lots and lots of things going on in our body often enzymes act as catalysts Enzymes are proteins with an active site that will bind to a specific substrate to do something. And that something will be much faster than if the enzyme was not present. So here's an enzyme. It has one big substrate, then it does its reaction, and the substrate becomes two little products. This would be an example of decomposition. So enzymes as catalysts do not get used up, and they lower activation energy. So normally you have reactants and a huge speed mountain of energy needed to get them to become products this could take years but if we add enzymes and the reactants only need to go over a little speed bump the activation energy is dramatically lowered and it's going to take seconds to lead to those products enzymes work in what's called a lock and key mechanism aka they are very specific they only work on their specific substrates and nothing else it's like a key only works for one kind of lock Enzyme sort of a robot, the substrate to bind to the active site, there's a complex formed, and then you get releasing the product and an unaltered enzyme ready to be used again. So anabolism. Anabolism occurs in living things. It's, it's a synthesis of large molecules and smaller. You're adding them together. Often requires energy, so you need ATP that'll get broken down to ADP to release that energy. Often used for growth and repair in an organism. And often water is formed. So this is dehydration synthesis. The precursors to water, OH and H, are in the substrate, and then those atoms are removed to form the molecule water. Dehydration, water is removed from the substrates to get us the product. And these are often reversible so that you can then use energy to go the opposite direction, which is useful because going the reverse way is often called catabolism where you take a large substrate and you break it down into smaller ones often this takes water as a substrate and as a bonus produces energy turning ADP into ATP and or producing heat since water is needed and gets broken between the parts of the substrate this is often called hydrolysis 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 water breaking breaking water this, for instance, is needed in the digestion of nutrients for food. So here we have two monosaccharides. Follow the arrow being turned into a disaccharide and water. Where the products, the products is the disaccharide and water. Where the substrates, the substrates are the monosaccharides. This turns out to be an anabolistic chemical reaction where two smaller molecules are forming a bigger molecule. Water is produced, so this is also a dehydration synthesis, and it's going to use ATP. Metabolic pathways. Sometimes we have to remember that we need one enzyme to do each little bitty step. And sometimes we have many, many steps necessary to go from the substrate all the way to the finished product. So we have a different enzyme that turns the substrate into the next substrate for the next enzyme and so forth and so on to lead it to the final product. And often this final product, when it becomes in a high enough concentration, will act as an inhibitor, stopping the pathway uh, at the first enzyme so that substrate one doesn't end up becoming intermediates that build up why waste the energy to do that we might not need it for a while phenokinetonuria is a severe intellectual disability a genetic disorder where someone is missing an important enzyme in the process of taking phenylalanine and turning it into other things and this leads to a buildup of phenylalanine in the person's body in toxic levels being severe uh, intellectual disability, as well as some rather severe physical uh, issues, including severe rashes. Um, fortunately, nowadays, we test infants for this, and if they're found to have this disorder, and they get on a very restricted diet to help limit the amount of phenylalanine they consume. Factors that alter enzymes. Well, this includes cofactors. Cofactors are necessary for some enzymes to function. Cofactors are inorganic. For instance, iron is a cofactor for hemoglobin to be able to bind oxygen. Sometimes they need coenzymes, coenzymes or organic substances. 
Often vitamins are derived from vitamins. The enzyme needs the coenzyme in order to function. These are things needed by the enzyme to be a functional structure. Denaturation is when enzymes' shape is permanently disrupted, causing them to lose their active site. This can be caused by high heat, extreme pHs, weird chemicals, electricity, radiation, and so forth. Energy, it turns out, is the capacity to do work. There are common forms of energy, heat, light, sound, electricity, mechanical energy, and chemical energy. And chemical energy is the main kind of energy used in cells. As we know, the energy currency of the cell is ATP. Here's ATP with its adenosine, its ribose sugar, and its three phosphates with that high energy bond between phosphate two and three. ATP is a nucleic acid. Uh, sometimes in the cytoplasm, you can get what's called ATP cycling where some sort of process occurs, ADP gets a phosphate bounded to it and becomes ATP. Then ATP needs to be used up, it loses its phosphate and returns to being ADP, and this cycle just keeps going on and on, turning ATP into ADP and ADP back into ATP. Cellular respiration is how we make ATP. Uh, it turns out we use oxygen to turn food into energy. This is why we breathe in. The specific Chemical reaction that is most common is glucose being, plus oxygen being turned into carbon dioxide that we breathe out, and water, and lots and lots of energy. Come, cellular respiration occurs in three main processes. The first is glycolysis, happens in the cytoplasm where the glucose is broken into two pyruvic acid molecules. We end up producing a net gain of two ATP and some high energy electrons that will be carried on a molecule to be used later. Then it enters the, the pyruvic acid, enters the uh, mitochondria, and there it will be modified to become acetyl coenzyme A. Acetyl coenzyme A will be formed and you also produce some high energy electrons and a carbon dioxide, which then can be breathed out. Acetyl coenzyme A then enters the citric acid cycle, a cycle of many chemical reactions that eventually continually uh, reforming axioloacetic acid that can then bind to acetyl coenzyme may become citric acid to continue the cycle over and over again with a net gain of two ATP as well as high energy electrons being carried in special molecules and carbon dioxide. So again enzyme with is produced acetyl coenzyme A comes in binds to product that becomes substrate one, which then gets used, becomes substrate two, which gets used, becomes substrate three, and so on. But it's a cycle because it's continually reforming product that then becomes necessary to form the first substrate. All right, then we have electron transport chain. This process occurs within the membrane inside of the mitochondria, so the second membrane in the mitochondria. In this process, various proteins and so on will use the energy in those high energy electrons being carried by specific molecules and able to form a gradient, a proton gradient that leads to the production of huge amounts of ATP. This is also where the oxygen is used and turned into water. So this is the aerobic part of cellular respiration. So cellular respiration or aerobic respiration is glucose plus six oxygen molecules get turned into Six carbon dioxide molecules plus six water molecules plus 36 ATP. Burn it, live it, love it. Uh, other energy sources, other things can enter the uh, aerobic respiration. Uh, proteins, amino acids can be broken down and become pyruvic acid or coenzyme A and be used as an energy source. Other types of uh, monosaccharides can be turned into glucose to enter the cycle. And also fats, triglycerides, can be broken down and enter this cycle as well. These are all excellent energy sources. And cellular respiration without oxygen is anaerobic respiration. No oxygen. Then the cell ferments. Inside of the cytoplasm, glucose gets turned into lactic acid and 2 ATP. And that's it. Very inefficient. All right, moving on to some other processes that occur in the cell. We have, as we know, DNA, a double helix molecule that stores the information, our genetic information, in the form of a gene. A gene is just a tiny portion of sequence that will lead to the production of a specific protein. 
the sort of like you have books that are the instructions for making a protein, each gene having its own protein. Here's a karyotype. This is all the chromosomes, 46 chromosomes in a human. As you can see, this is a male because it has a Y chromosome. And it turns out this is a weird karyotype because there are actually three chromosome 21, so this is actually someone with Down syndrome. All right, a nucleotide is a phosphate group, a 5-carbon sugar, and a nitrogenous base. And these are the nucleotides that get attached to each other to form the sugar phosphate backbone that forms the ribbon part of the DNA. The nitrogenous bases form hydrogen bonds between the two strands to connect the strands together. Um, in DNA, there are four different nitrogenous bases, adenine, thylacine, guanosine, and thiamine. Turns out with complementary base pairing, A will always bind with T, T will always bind with A, C will always bind with G, and G will always bind with C. So if you have a C on one side, you have to have a G on the other side. These two strands are oriented in opposite directions, so they're sort of pointed the opposite way. And this is important to allow for the proper hydrogen bonding between the nitrogenous bases. So during DNA replication, the DNA has to be separated into two separate strands, into its two separate strands. And then a new strand of DNA is formed on each of these separate strands, uh, basically meaning you have one old strand and one new strand using the old strand as the template, because G has to bind to C, and C has to bind to G, and so on. So some important proteins. You have the helicase protein that unwinds the DNA into its two strands. You have the DNA polymerase, the enzyme complex that will then produce the new DNA strand using the old DNA strand as a template, and ligase that comes in if there's any breaks to build the DNA strand up as one long strand. Uh, then, of course, the DNA needs to be kept safe in the nucleus. It never leaves the nucleus, so it needs to be able to send the information out in a simple, easy, disposable form. Form, and this form is the messenger RNA, mRNA. So the mRNA is a copy of one gene. The mRNA is formed via transcription, where an RNA polymerase, this enzyme, comes in, opens the DNA strand, and makes a new strand of RNA that's copying the DNA, so it has the same proximate sequence. Big difference, though, is in RNA, you have your cell instead of thiamine. Uh, so, as we can see, if this is the DNA template, then the RNA will have a U to the A, C to the G, G to the C, C to the D, A to the C, G to the A, G to the C. Complementary base pairing. The single strand codes for a single gene that makes a polypeptide or a protein and then will leave the nucleus to go into the cytosol. There it has to be turned into a protein. However, wait a minute, we have four nucleotides, 20 amino acids. How does this work? Well, it turns out that we look at the nucleotides in terms of three. So three bases of the messenger RNA is one codon. Each codon will code for an amino acid. So here we have three uh, sequences forming different codons. In this case, these two will lead to phenylalanine and so on. So to use this lovely chart, you have your three sequences, A, U, G. So you find the A, go to the first letter A, somewhere here, U, second letter U over here, and G. Uh, third letter G, so this is it, AUG codes for methionine. Translation involves the ribosome. The ribosome will make DNA, uh, protein using the codon sequence on the messenger RNA as, a, uh, as the sequence for the proteins, where tRNA was, has an anticodon. This anticodon binds to the codon, complementary sequencing, and each tRNA has its own special amino acid based on the anticodon. So you're able to translate the codons into amino acids. Ribosomes will then form long chains of amino acids, giving us our protein. Here's the big story. Learn it, live it, love it. All right, here's an example. Here's the sequence of DNA. First, we have to turn it to messenger RNA, then break it in units of three, and then we can use this lovely chart to determine the amino acids that will be deformed. Learn and love this chart. Mutations is when there's permanent change to the DNA that can get passed on. If the mutation is serious, it can cause major problems. If it's beneficiary, it can be a great thing. Uh, point mutations, where one single nucleotide is changed, this will only potentially change that one amino acid, although it could be a silent mutation where there's no actual change. Frame shift mutations, you lose a nucleotide, and then you end up changing all the amino acids after the mutation, and it's very much a problem. 
So don't let that happen. Thank you.